Okay, so anyway, um, we postponed the homework from yesterday to today, and there's usually questions about this, this, this one that I have up on the screen, figure 5.29 is, the, is a figure for the exercise. Are there questions about this? Do you guys want me to give you some hints? Yes? Okay, I've already done it to several outside class, but... So here, let me give you the guiding principle. All computations take input, do processing, and produce output. In a computer system, the only way that a program can execute is if it's written in machine language. That's your key idea. That is your guiding principle to how to do this, solve this problem. Are you with me? Because look, what does the von Neumann cycle do? Fetch the what? Instruction. Then what? Decodes it. And how does it decode it? It takes the binary and the ones and the zeros for the opcode and it looks it up. It's wired in. Those, that binary is wired in. That's, so the only way a program can ever execute at all, ever, ever, is if it's written in machine language. That means in this figure 5.29, under processing, you notice that's file A. File A has to be a, a program written in machine language. That's your guiding principle. If you have a file that is like an assembly, if you have a file that is a program written in assembly language, that file cannot be in the processing box. Are you with me? What that means is that it has to be, it, so if you need to execute that program and you need it in, in machine language, what do you have to do? On, a, on an earlier run, on, before you can do that, you have to do what? You've got to use a translator to translate it into. That. And so look, this is all also, this is um, also the whole point of this figure. That's the whole point of this figure 5.8. In figure 5.8, we have an application that's written in assembly language, but we can't just put that application written in assembly language. We can't just process it because it's not in machine language. So you see in figure 5.8 what happens is we put the we use an assembler. And so what is what is the input to an assembler? A program. And what's the output of the, of the assembler? The same program, but written in a what? Different language. So if you notate your files, and if you ever like r do a translation, what you should do is you should write down the output is this program that does the same thing as the input, but written in a different language. And the, you have to arrange your runs so that every time you do a run, what is in the processing box has to be in machine language. And if you, if you follow that principle, there's only one way to do it. You can figure out exactly what goes in each one of those runs. Now, are, are we good? I think this, I think this, is, the, this is the key idea. This is a, a key idea in computer systems, is that the von Neumann cycle operates on bits in machine language. And so we have these translators to get all of our programs into machine language before we can run them. That's a key, 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 key principle of computer systems. So, everybody, so does that help? Do you, so you see how? So what you should do is, you know, I think there's only one possibility of the, all the files that you have, there's only one file that's written in machine language. That is a machine language program. So that's what's going to be in the first run. And then the question is, well, if that's a program and it's written in machine language, what does it do? What does it take as input and what does it produce as output? Well, if it's a translator, it is the first, is here in A, I don't remember. What did we say in figure 5.29? What did we say file A was? What does the exercise say that file A is? So it is a, an assembly language. So, it, so, so wait, it, it, it's written in, it's some, it has to be written in machine language though, right? What did you say again? Uh, assembly language assembly written in machine. So notice that it's written in machine language. So yeah. All right, so uh, I think that should help. And then, um, 
So with this one also on the written one, you need to type it up in a text editor and then save it as PDF, export as PDF, or do on a Mac you say, you can do print and then do save as PDF and then hand in the PDF so we can grade it with PDF markup. Okay, are we good? Now, before we go on, um, we actually have a lot to do today, but before we go on, I want to give, I want to show a demo because the question was yesterday when we did, or the last time when we did symbols, and we had this care in and care out, and the question was, well, wait a minute, care in and care out, where are they? And I'm gonna show, what I'd like to do, I want, I want to show you exactly where care in and care out are in the operating system. It's kind of slick. So, Let's do this demo. Okay, so here's our demo. Now watch this, you guys. This is, you know how we can go to the help system and how we can put any one of the figures from the, books, from the book in here and we can copy to source? Watch this. If you're interested, you can go all the way down to the very bottom. And what do we have? The very last thing is the what? Pep9 operating system. So we can click this and here's the whole operating system. And what you can do is you can copy to source. So there's the, here's the whole operating system, all copied to source. Are you with me? And what you can do if you're interested is you can go into the trap handler and you can modify, you can create your own new little instruct, uh, your own trap instructions. You can go in and actually modify the operating system and everything will work. Okay, and that's in chapter eight or nine, I think. But unfortunately, we don't have time to do that in this course, but it's really slick. You can actually go in and write your own trap instructions or modify the trap instructions. And look, and so if you come up here to system, we, we can do assemble install new OS. Of course, I'm in, installing the old OS by doing this. And notice that it built it. So here's the object code and here's the assembler listing. And look, you guys, right here up in this top of the operating system. What do we have here right on this line right here? What does that say? Karen colon. You see? There's the care, there's the symbol. And can you tell on this listing what its value is? This Karen, what is its value? FC15. You see? And the next line is what? Care out. And what is its value? FC16. And what is Karen? It's a, what is Karen and care out? What is it, what's the source code? Dot block what? One because it's a single character. It's it's a single. It's a character input and a character a character input device and a character output device, and a character is one ASCII character is one byte. So it's dot block one. So that's where they are wired into memory. So anyway, I thought that would. Be, oh, and here's another thing, you guys. The symbol tables. The symbol tables are always printed at the bottom of the listing. So here, if we come down here, here's the symbol table for all the symbols that are in the operating system. And if we scroll down here, what do we see here? Care in, and what is its value? FC15, and here we have what? Yeah, FC16. Was that also printed on like the examples we were doing last time? At the bottom? Or we should open it? Oh yes, all of the programs that you do, if you notice, every time you, every time you run a you assemble a program in PEP9 and you go to the listing, if you scroll down to the bottom, that symbol table is there, yeah. I, sh I thought about, I regretted not demoing that, but yeah, and you, should, you should look at that. And yeah, it collects, and that's the internal symbol table that the assembler uses to generate the code, you know, when it counts up what the values of the symbols are. Yeah. Okay, end of demo. Okay, so anyway, I thought that demo would be interesting to see actually, so it take away a little bit of the mystery of that care in and care out. Now, um, the next few slides illustrate what the compiler does. I would like to just give you a feeling for what the compiler does uh, in the translation process. Now, what's the difference between a compiler and an assembler? An assembler translates from what level? Assembly language, Assembly language ASMB, Five, whereas a compiler is where? HOL6. From HOL6. Now, there's, and the languages at HOL6 are way different from, from assembly language. They are much more uh, powerful and much more complex and much, uh, much higher level of abstraction. But a lot, some of the translation principles are the same. And in the same way that an assembler has a symbol table, the compiler has, an assemb has a symbol table. 
And you know the concept of type? You know whenever you write int i, what are you saying? You're saying that i has type what? Integer. So you give that a type. The whole concept of type is, is, does not exist in assembly language. So the whole concept of type, type is enforced by the compiler. And I want to give you a little idea, try to give you a little flavor of, of, of how the compiler does that. So in figure 5.23, I've shown kind of a hypothetical symbol table for the compiler. Now in figure 5.23, what, what are the global variables are what? Care, CH is type what? Care, uh, J is type what? So you see in the symbol table, what I've indicated here is the symbol CH, the symbol is CH, its value is 0003, that's where it will be stored in main memory. But look, the symbol table for the compiler has an extra column labeled what? Kind. And so that says what kind of variable it is. So it's storing, oh, this is a character variable for CH. And for J it's saying, oh, th this is an integer variable. So the compiler stores that information about the type of the uh, variable in the program. Do you see what we're saying? So, it, it, so, that, so that, that type is just kept, the, the compiler keeps track of the type of each variable. So now here in the next figure is a hypothetical program. Suppose we had int J and float Y. All right, int j and float y. So float means what? Floating point. Floating point. So it has a decimal point. So now, can you take the mod? Can you take the mod of an integer? So if you say j gets j mod eight, is that legal? Yeah. That's legal. But because what is mod? It's the remainder when you do what? Division. Divide by eight, right? But a floating point value, you can't. That's illegal. So how does, so what does, and so how does the compiler, what does the compiler do? The compiler prevents that from happening because what, you see this symbol table for the compiler, what does it have for the, as symbol j, value 0003, kind is a what? That's int. That's int. But y, it says, y is going to be stored at 0005, but it notes from the program listing that y is a what? A floating point value. So when it, it so when the compiler gets to y gets y mod eight, what does it do? It looks up in its symbol table and says, "Oh, this is a floating point. I can't allow that." So then it will not. It, so the program does not compile. It's an error, and it, you can't generate any code. But it's the compiler that prevents you from generating that code. You see what I mean? The concept of type is enforced by the compiler in its symbol table. Does everybody see what we're, that's the idea. That's, the idea is that types are a high level restriction, they are a restriction on high level languages that are strongly typed. Anyway, so I thought that would be, that's, that's just, uh, and then uh, I want to say just a few more general things about trace tags. Uh, there's two kinds of trace tags, format trace tags and symbol trace tags. We, uh, with global variables, we only use format trace tags. Um, and we used, what did we use? Hashtag 2D for 2 byte decimal and 1C for 1 byte character. So we've, we've got these other possibilities. Uh, 1 byte character, 1 byte decimal, 1 byte hexadecimal is hashtag 1H and 2 byte hexadecimal is hashtag 2H. So we'll see, we'll use these in the future uh, when they crop up. Now I want to do one more translation before we go to the next chapter. Um, and to do these, this next, to translate this next program, we need to do some, use some new instructions. So the first one here is the arithmetic shift right. So we all know what ASR does. We've learned how that, what that does. So there's an instruction called arithmetic shift right. And so it's ASR, there's two versions, ASRA, which does an arithmetic shift right of what register? The accumulator. And then ASRX does an arithmetic shift right of the index register. And these are unary, right? There's no operand specifier because it just shifts one bit to the right. 
those, does everybody see? Okay. And then here's uh, before and after, figure 5.25 and 5.26. So if the accumulator has 009A in it, and then you do an arithmetic shift right accumulator, what, what does it turn into? 004C. So if you write that out in binary, you know, can you see that 9 is what? 1001 zero, zero, one, and 8 is 1000, zero, 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 so that gets shifted, and so that's 004C zero, 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 anyway. Yeah? So that's your, and then the arithmetic shift left is the same kind of thing, only it goes to the left instead of to the right. So now there's two versions ASLA for arithmetic shift left accumulator, and arithmetic shift left index register is ASLX. And so let's go back. What does ASR do to a value? The arithmetic shift right, but what does it do to the value of a number, of an integer? Does it multiply or divide? Well, wait, divides it. It divides. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so ASR does which? Divides. Divides by two. And here, ASL does what? Multiplies by two. So anytime you have some code and you need to multiply times two, that's how you do it. And then, you know, we had the rotate instructions. So there's an ROLX, ROLA, and ROLX for rotate left. And um, some RORA and RORX. These are common... We're not going to use these very much. In fact, I'm not sure if we use them at all, but they are in all machine. They're very representative. They're in all machine instruction sets. They have rotates as well as shifts. And now we have our next concept of how to translate from HOL 6 to assembly level 5. And that is a constant. Now, let me ask you a question. Is a constant stored at a fixed location in memory, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> what is stored at a fixed location in memory? Global, Global what? Variable. Global variables. It turns out that constants are not variables, and so they are not stored at a fixed location in memory. So we need to think about this. So now, 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 tell me this. What is the value of a symbol? An it's an address. There is an exception to the rule. The one exception to the rule is with a dot equate, the value of the symbol is not an address. So we should write that down. Exception. Exception to the rule. The value of a symbol in front of a dot equate is not an address. The value of a symbol in front of a dot equate is not an address. That's an exception. That's an exception to the rule. Is everybody with me on this? Okay, so unfortunately, you know, it's like in English. You know, you learn all these rules for spelling and things, and then, oh, there's an exception to the rule. The plural is, does not end in S. You got to, you know. So this is an exception to the rule. Okay, usually, symbols are addresses. But So what does equate do? First of all, notice that e dot .equate does not generate object code. No object code. It does not generate object code. Instead what it does is, the value that you give for the dot .equate, that's the value of the symbol. What it does is it equates the value of the symbol to the value of the dot .equate. So the value of the constant symbol is not an address. Instead, the value of the symbol is equated to the value of the dot equate. And I think the best way to do this is to do another translation. Okay? And you'll, we'll see, just think of, think of that concept and we'll see how, how it plays out in this figure 5.27. All right. Well, last time we started at the first row, this time we'll start at the second row. Okay?
So, <laughs> you're up. Now here's our figure, 5.27, const int bonus equals 10, int exam 1, int exam 2, int score, int main, scan f, exam 1, exam 2, score gets exam 1 plus exam 2, divided by 2 plus bonus, print f score equals score, returns 0 bot. That's what we're going to translate. So we're going to translate this one line at a time into a single language. And I, th I think we'll be able to do it. Now, do you remember what we always start off, we have a bunch of, 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 of uh, global variables at the top. So what's the first? Oh, you got it easy. Branch to me. Now, you've got the hard one. <laughs> The first thing, what do we, what's the next line there? Const int bonus equals 10. Is that a variable, yes or no? Correct, it is not. It is a constant. So do you know what the symbol would be? Can you guess what the symbol would be? We haven't done this yet, so you're kind of, but can you, can you take a guess, you want to pass? Sure. Do you, do you, do you have an idea? What, what, what would the symbol be? You want to pass? What do you think the symbol would be? Bonus. Bonus. The symbol would be bonus, just like this. Are you with me? So this is going to be bonus. All right. And what do you think, what do you think, what does this say, constant bonus equals in? So what do you think, what do you think? Let's go back here to... Dot equate. Dot equate. And then 10. Well, it, it, hold, yeah, hold on. So it is dot equate, E-Q-U, it is dot equate, and it's just 10. I would, I would be immediate addressing, and this is not an instruction, it's a dot command. So dot commands don't have addressing modes. Are you with me? Now, now, what does this do? First of all, does it generate code, yes or no? It doesn't. It does not. But what does it do? It makes what? Equates. Bonus have what value? 10. See, bonus equates to 10. Now this is super important. Does everybody see what dot equate does? It equates this value to 10. You can write this in hex. You know, you can do 0x whatever or, you know. But if you don't have a 0x, then it's the decimal value. Is everybody clear? Yeah. Does that also mean that you can't change the value of it? That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Now what about int exam 1? Exam one. And then it should be dot block. Dot block, how many? Uh, two. Two, because it's an integer and it's two bytes for an integer. And do you remember how we annotated this? Uh, the or yeah, the variable the two D. Yeah, pound two D because it's a two byte decimal. Okay, next. Exam two. Dot block two. Good. Next. Score. Good. So far, so good. We're really on a roll here. Um, now, next, we're in main. In main so what, and, and this was branched to main, so what goes here? Main. Main. Now, what's the first thing that main does? It does scanf into what? Exam 1 and exam 2. So how do we scan f into exam 1? Desi. Desi. Decimal input into what? Exam one and addressing mode? Direct, because it's a global variable at a fixed location in memory, and exam one is the address of where it gets the decimal input. Excellent. Next. Um, How do we do the scanf into exam two? Uh, how do we do, how do we scan f into, uh, exam two? yeah, how do we scan f into? Desi, exam two, comma D. Is everybody good? Is everybody clear on that? Okay, so now the, what's the next one? Score gets exam one plus exam two divided by two plus bonus. 
Now, so how, how are we going to do that? We're going to have to... Well, we're going to have to calculate what's on the right-hand side of the assignment statement and then give it to the variable on the left. So what's the first thing we have? To, how do we do exam one plus exam two? Yes, but before we add, we have to add, add adds what's in the accumulator. So what do we have to do first? Load word accumulator from where? Good. From exam one direct. And so that gets exam one into the accumulator. Now, what do you think? Add accumulator. Add accumulator. Exam two. Direct addressing. Okay. Does everybody see how this is rolling out? Okay, and now we added. Now, now, what's the next thing? Now we have to do that sum. You're up. Is it arithmetic shift left? Left or right? We're dividing by two. Right. Right. So that's what. Um, A S R accumulator, and that's unary, so there's no operand specifier. Does everybody see how that worked? All right, are we good? Now, how do we add this bonus? Is bonus a variable, yes or no? No. It is not, it's a constant. So it's not stored at a fixed location in memory. So how do we add bonus? Just like add, add accumulator. Bonus. Add accumulator. Bonus, but wait a minute. Bonus comma. Immediate? Yes! Does everybody see? It's immediate because bonus has the value 10. That is its constant value. Bonus immediate. Now there's all, there's a, do you see all the meaning that there is in this? There's a whole, lots of meaning going on in each one of these little addressing modes. Yeah, question? So does that mean it like doesn't refer to like any address? Correct. It does not go to, to it does not go to address 10. Right. It, it doesn't go there to get the operand. Oh, but it still sees where, like, bonus. But bo bo bonus was equated to 10. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. But what would have happened if you did bonus direct? Then it would have gone to location 10. You'd have to see where the bits are at, actually, that would be A, at 0, 0, 0, A. You'd have to see where the bits, what the bits are at 0, 0, 0, A, and that's where it would have gone to get to do the addition. And the assembler, if you, if you make a mistake and do that, that's, that's literally what will happen. Okay. Yeah? What's the benefit of using a constant? Well, same as in a high-level language program. Self-documentation. And this is the way the compiler translates constants. Are you with me? Yeah, so that's program documentation. Yeah? Does everybody... Yeah? Okay, so, and now, what's the next one? So now we've got, the, we've got all that stuff, the exam one plus exam two divided by two plus bonus, and where is all that, where is that quantity? It's in the where? It's in the, it's in the accumulator, so now what do we have to do? Um, store, word. store word accumulator into what? Score. Score using what addressing mode? Uh, direct. Excellent. Oh, you guys are good. And now how do we do printf? Stroh, so string output. And now we're going to, yeah, somewhere at the bottom we'll, we'll have a message, a string message. So MSG direct, and we'll get to that later. Now how do we, uh, out, how do we print F the score? Yes, it is a decimal number and it's a global, so what? Decimal Excellent. <coughs> Deso. Score. Score. Addressing mode? Direct, because it's a global variable. At a fixed location in memory, and score is the, is the address of where it's stored. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. And then return zero, so then we do stop. Oh, I should have asked this time. <laughs> now, now what, do, what do we have to put before the dot n? What should we put here? Do you, do you know or you want to pass? Okay, you, what, what goes here? Dot ASCII. Oh, 
Yeah, yes, yeah, not ASCII here. We need the string, but what are we going to... Well, I think, I think it's this. When we wrote this, we were anticipating that we would call this... Yeah. Are you with me? And then dot ASCII what? Um, Quote, score. score equals... Equals, and then do we, don't we need a, and then is it, uh, looks like a space, and then a what? Percent. Oh, and then, and then the percent D, that's, that's how, that, the deso did that, right? So then we need a, but this is a string, so we need a what? A bash X, zero, zero. Oh, shoot, I just realized something. I just realized we needed a, because it also says we need to print out a bash n after the score. So I forgot. Anyway, let's see how well we did. Did we do it? Now look at figure 5.27, this, this part of it. Look at branch to main, okay, and main is at 0009. And now look at that dot equate 10. Look at that dot equate 10. What code was generated by that dot equate 10? What code got generated with that dot equate 10? None. There's nothing in the source code column. Do you see it's blank there? Does everybody see that? It's blank. All right, so dot equate does not generate code. And look at the at, look at line um, at zero zero one six. That's add accumulator of what? Bonus. Bonus immediate. And what and so what is the what's the code at that address? Six zero and then what? Zero 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 a. Now why is that zero 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 a? Because that's the ten. The decimal ten. Hexadecimal A, decimal 10. Are you with me? And to answer your question, what if that were, what if that were direct addressing by mistake? You said bonus direct addressing. You would go to 000A, so what's that, what are the bits at 000A? What are the bits at 000A? 0003, it would actually add, it would have added 3 to answer your question. That, that would have been an error. Yeah? Does everybody see? Yeah, question? Could you take that dot ASCII and put it up there? Yeah, our convention is always going to have, is going to, to always have the dot ASCII messages after the stop at the bottom. Okay. That's a coding convention. Okay. So always do that. Always follow that convention. You could put it up there and branch around it, but the ASCII strings are long and so, yeah. Okay, are we good? And now look at this next part of the figure 5.27. What is the value, look, what is the value of exam 2? What's the value of exam 2? 0005. So if you come back up here to the listing, do you see that exam 2, where is it stored, where is exam 2 stored? At what? 0005. But here, if we look at the symbol table for bonus, what's the value of bonus? 00A. Is 00A an address, yes or no? No, it's not. It's the value that bonus was equated to. Is everybody clear? Do you see how that works? Okay, good deal. All right, so that's the end of this chapter. Now, you guys, um, let me set us up for what we're going to do next. At this point, if we were to follow along the topics in the book sequentially, we just finished chapter 5, and we would go to chapter 6, and in chapter 6 we learn all these issues of how to translate, how a compiler translates from C down to assembly language. But we are going to take a detour for the time being, we are going to jump ahead and we're going to skip chapter 6 and we're going to go to directly to chapter 7. 
Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Okay, we're going to go to seven. We're going to go directly to seven. We're not going to pass go. We're not going to collect $200. And the reason is because the topic in chapter seven is language translation principles. Now look, you guys, what is this big project that you're going to write? You are going to write a what? A Java program that is a what? An assembler. So do you understand? Do you understand now manually? how to translate from assembly language to machine language? You understand manually how to do that? So, what, here, what's the fundamental question of computer science? What can, be what can be automated? So what does an assembler do? It translates from one programming language to another. So we automate that process. So you're going to write a program to do that. And the reason we're jumping ahead to chapter 7 is because we need to get we, we need to get started. It's a long project. We need to get started on it early. So if we were to do chapter 6 first, we wouldn't have time to write the, write the project. So here's the, here's the plan from now on. We're going to go through chapter 7. We're going to learn these language translation principles. And after we get enough of that stuff under our belt, then you will be working on your project. And we'll go back to chapter 6. And, we'll be, and as we work through chapter 6, you will also be working on your project at the same time in the background. You see what I mean? What assignment is that? Uh, I don't remember what the assignment number is, but it is one of the assignment. It's, it's, it's an exercise in the back of chapter seven. Okay. It's a, a problem in the back of chapter seven to write, a, to write the program. Okay, is everybody good? Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to learn these language translation principles. Now the first thing we're gonna learn is uh, the concepts of a grammar. So, here we go. We are translating languages. We are translating statements in languages. So the question is, what is a language? Well, every language has an alphabet. What is an alphabet? An alphabet is a non-empty set of characters. All right? And what is the operation? Whenever you, what do you do whenever you write an English sentence? What do you do? You concatenate letters in the English language. What is concatenation? Just joining them together. So the operation in a grammar, the operation is concatenation. Okay? And, you know, uh, we have an identity element for concatenation. And the empty string is the identity element for concatenation. And the symbol f for the empty string, well, we'll get to it in a minute. The symbol for the empty string the symbol for the empty string is this lowercase Greek epsilon. Okay. And that's going to be the identity element for concatenation. So let's take a look at some examples. Here is an example of the alphabet for the C language. So if you take a look at all those C programs that we've been analyzing, what are they? They are just concatenations of the lowercase letters, the uppercase letters, the plus, the minus, the asterisk, the slash, the equals, the less, less than, the greater than. Is everybody C? Each one of those is a character in the alphabet for the C programming language. Are you with me? Is everybody, is everybody good? Here's another example. This is, the, this is the alphabet that you are going to deal with. This is the PEP9 assembly language alphabet. So what does the PEP9 assembly language program look like? Lowercase letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uppercase letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The bash, the period, the comma, the colon, the semicolon, the single quote, and the double quote. All right? So everybody, so you, you recognize when you, you just string these together, and that's how you write a, an assembly language program, a PEP9 assembly language program. This next alphabet is the alphabet for real numbers. So, the real, so what does a real number look like? A real number looks like... Plus four seven point five. This is an example of a real number. And what is it? It's a concatenation of characters from the alphabet. Is everybody clear? So that's that's the alphabet for real numbers. So the concatenation then is the operation of joining two or more characters to make a string, and it applies not only to concatenating one character to another character. It also applies to concatenating one character to a string and one string to another string to construct longer strings. 
And here, as we mentioned a minute ago, the empty string is this Greek letter lowercase epsilon, and the concatenation property is that if you have the empty string concatenated with x, that's the same thing as x concatenated with the empty string, and that's the same thing as just what? X. x. So that means that, that means that what? The empty string is the what element? Identity. Empty string is identity of concatenation. What is the identity for multiplication? One. Why is that? So, because one times what? X equals what? X times one, which equals what? X. So what that says is that one is the identity for multiplication. Okay, so, all right, is everybody clear on that? Okay, now the question, and now we have a big question. What is a language? So when you, the last time you opened up a page in a book, what did you read? A sequence of what? A sequence of letters. Now, tell me, is this a valid sentence? I'm going to write down, I'm going to write down a sequence of letters. The sky is blue. Is that a sentence in the English language? It is. How about this one? X, P, R, bash, bash, or bang, bang, Q, period, period, D. Is this a sentence in the English language? Yes or no? No, it's not, right? So the question is, what is a language? Well, look, you take the T, the alphabet of the English language, and T star is the closure of that alphabet. Now, what do we mean by closure? We mean the set of all possible strings. Are you with me? So does everybody understand that this is in the closure? This is in T star. This is also in the closure. This is in T star. So what is a language? A language is not all the possible ones. A language is the what? It's just certain ones. So what is a language formally? A language is a what? Subset of the what? Closure of its what? Alphabet. Now does everybody see? That's what a language is. And how do we know, given one string, given another string, how do we know if it's a legal sentence? How do we know if it's a legal sentence? Well, in other words, how do you specify which, which concatenations are legal? Well, there's three ways. Now, have any of you guys had automata theory? Who has had automata theory? So there have been a couple. So you guys already know this, a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, this is a good intro for automata theory if you had had this first, actually. So now look, there are three ways, three techniques to specify what is a legal string of characters that are in the language. The first one is a grammar. The second one is a finite state machine. And the third one is a regular expression. And what we're going to learn in here are we're going to learn grammars and finite state machines. And we will leave it to the automata theory course for you to learn what a regular expression is. Okay, but these are the three ways to specify a grammar. Uh, sorry, these are the three ways to specify a language. And so we'll start with grammars. Now, I think, did you guys do grammars in your intro? I think in your, one of your intro classes, you think you got introduced to this concept. Oh, good, so this is familiar. So what are the four parts of a grammar? Ah, this is a nice exam question. Four parts of a grammar. Yeah. Fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. Oh, no, that's the von Neumann cycle. <laughs> so what are the four parts of a grammar? C++ program. <laughs> uh, let see, global variables, forward, fixed location memory. Oh, no, no, that's the C++, the C, C memory model. What are the four parts of a grammar? N, which is a what? Non-terminal non alphabet. T, which is a what? Terminal. terminal alphabet. P, which is a what? Set of rules of production. And S, which is a what? The start symbol, which is an element of what? N. This you have to memorize. This you need to know. 
And here in figure 7.1 is a specific example of a grammar. Now you see, now what was N? What did we say N was? N is a what? What does it say here? A non -tru So do you see, how many elements are there in N in figure 7.1? How many, are the elements, how many elements in that set? Three. There's three. So identifier is a non-terminal symbol. Letter in brackets is a non-terminal symbol. And digit in brackets is a non-terminal symbol. Is everybody clear? Okay. And what about T? What was T? Let's go back here. What was T? A term so what are the other characters in the terminal alphabet? A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. So the terminal characters are the characters that you actually see in a sentence in the language. Are we good? Those are the terminal alphabets. And what was the third one? P, which is a set of what? Rules, rules of production. So these, are, so these are the productions. So P is the production. So how many production rules do we have in this grammar? So how many production rules do we have in this grammar? Nine. nine. We've got nine of them. Okay. And so the first production rule is identifier produces letter. The second one is identifier produces identifier concatenated with letter. The third one is identifier produces identifier concatenated with digit. The fourth one is letter produces A. The fifth one is letter produces B. Letter produces C. Digit produces one. Digit produces two. Digit produces three. And then what is the S here? S, the start symbol, is an element of what? N. So now which one was N? Identifier letter. So do you see which one? So what is S? Identifier, which is the one of the ones in N. Okay, so anyway, it sound, looks, looks like it's time to go. So we'll pick this up next time. Now, you actually have a homework assignment due Thursday. And it's this grammar stuff. So I'm going to let you go ahead and read it. And we're going to tentatively go ahead and have it due on Thursday. But maybe we'll give you a little bit of an extension like till Friday. But not till Monday because we need to get back on track. Okay? So see you next time.